I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am. I'm doing awesome. I'm just trying to make sure that when it's all said and done, that we give the people something solid. And it's, I was, it's been a long time coming and the pleasure is always mine. And what I wanted to do is I was just telling the people during the intro is having people who have dedicated their lives to success, but in the sport, they don't always understand the whole journey in this thing. And what I wanted to do is make sure that as we talk today that people truly got an insight to some of the things that people who are at the, who've reached the higher levels in, in, the, in the sport of boxing. And for those of you who, uh, hold on one second. Let me see if I can go back. Oh, this whole, hold on one second. I, pull, I need to hit this feature again to make sure that we're streaming. There we go. You still with us, so? Yeah, 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 I'm here. All right, good deal. So we want to give an insight because all these youngsters, whether they're trainers, coaches, they basically only see the smoke and mirrors, the stuff that people are, what they reach when once they get to a certain level and they don't realize that there's a, a real, uh, just a vicious grind before they actually get to that point. So I would love for you, before we get started, going on with the other topics, as we spoke specifically to the protests and you know the players, and one of the things that I'd like for you to also weigh in on is pre preparation for your career after the sport of boxing. And uh, so what I want you to weigh in on is pretty much how your career got started and the first, tournament that you uh, you allowed yourself in which is one of the first reality shows in that market so tell the fans those who are watching a little bit about your beginning and how you were introduced to reality tv and that's the very beginning okay um my, my name is otis griffin of course uh, uh i uh i'm originally from troy alabama uh, uh implant of sacramento california um, what happened uh, with me, uh, I came over from the sport of football. Uh, I uh, went to Texas A&M, uh, uh, West Texas A&M, and um, I uh, was uh, in camp in the NFL uh, with, with a couple of teams. And then what happened was uh, I, I went over to uh, the Arena Football League, and it was funny how uh, I got into boxing because I got in a fight with one of my teammates over um, – over some, uh, you know, hearsay uh, about uh, starting in football and stuff like that. And my uh, teammate, uh, Eddie Knipsey, actually was a martial artist. He uh, was uh, um, from Hawaii and um, the University of Hawaii at that. And uh -huh. uh, he uh, uh, was a caballera uh, expert. And um, so we got a <laughs> big bite. It was funny. Um, uh, at first, you know, just straight throwing hands and stuff like that. It was all good. He was, and you know, looking back, I can tell that he obviously uh, was letting me get my uh, negative energy out and he probably wasn't going to do much but make me miss. But then I um, got lucky and I busted his, his nose open. Then it became like a Bruce Lee movie. He went back and he That's tasted funny. his blood. <laughs> he was like, oh, you want to fight? <laughs> <laughs> so then from there, uh, you know, to, and to make the story short, my my uh, my roommate at the time, John Jefferson, was like, "Man, it was like Mortal Comeback, man. Like, it was like finish him. He's he's like he hit you with so much uh, uh, stuff, man. He's like, I was like, what, what's going on? So from there, uh, I went. Uh, uh, we both got kicked off the team, uh, the Los Angeles Avengers down in LA, and um, mm -hmm. uh, from from there, uh, uh, I come home, and uh, um, I wanted to learn uh, martial arts, of course, because I'm like, man, you, you got to know way more than just street fighting nowadays. So oh, I go yeah. to Master Navarone's gym, my first trainer uh, mm -hmm. up in Roseville, because um, he was a, uh, a boxing and kickboxing instructor. Um, he trained uh, over all the years. He trained Dennis Alexio, um, all the UFC guys from Rampage Jackson uh, mm -hmm. to Nick Ford, wow. to, um, to uh, uh, the Diaz brothers. Um, and then you know, at the time when I forward. came in, he had uh, uh, Mike Sims uh, in the gym working out, a uh, uh, light heavyweight gold medalist at the amateur uh, level. Um, he had Eric Regan, who was uh, the uh, middleweight uh, champion at the time. 
uh, mm-hmm. and the, uh, Chris Cruz. So wow. for the whole year, I came a whole year every day, came, took his classes, all the application classes, never sparred, oh. never talked to the guy. He, he, it was old school. He didn't want to talk to me, nothing, until he was sure that I was going to come every day. Now that I look back, I know that at the time, I was just like, oh, this guy don't like me. Oh, yeah. Uh, finally, um, uh, sparring was going one day, and he's like, hey, go back there. I want you to spar with the pros. So I get in. Um, a funny thing happened. Uh, uh, I couldn't hit them, yeah. but they couldn't hit me because uh, I ran backwards for a living. I played safety. Uh, uh, <laughs> Pro football level, I played safety. So backpedaling was my thing. So I would swing, run backwards, run sideways. They couldn't hit me. And then I was swinging them, miss. <laughs> we just keep going and going. And then finally, um, he uh, he was like, hey, uh, let me put you in some amateur fights. Uh, and um, I had uh, uh, only 10 amateur fights. Um, I went nine and one. But everyone I fought had like, uh, you know, over 100 fights. Oh, man. So, yeah, so they were trying to speed me up, definitely. And right about that time, Hall of Fame promoter uh, uh, Don Chargan uh, was uh, uh, a mentor for uh, Asa De La Hoya and uh, Eric Gomez, who was the president of Golden Boy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they were starting their company. So um, they had already been through 16 countries and, like, uh, thousands of people. And they came down to the last 30 people they were going to invite to L.A. But yeah. they hadn't found like you know someone with that story so um uh they asked don did he know anybody and then he's like oh nasser has a um an amateur kid over at his uh his gym that you know looks to part he's, he's green but he used to play in the nfl and uh you know he has- so i went down you know uh at the time uh, my, my one of my brothers had just passed away and um Everything, all the, all the, um, as far as Hollywood, all the, all the stars aligned. Uh, we had a box off uh, of the last uh, 30 people, and uh, I was one of the last 12 guys standing. Wow. So when you got started, what happened is everything was kind of happen chance, and that's one of the reasons I want, I wanted to go into that discussion with you. Pretty much just for the simple fact that people really just don't realize that it's a progressive forward movement and knowing that you went about it this is where i wanted them to see sort of sort of the things that are give them some likelihoods and uh appreciate that man so that story how you were really in a position and made the most of it and just the fact that you didn't have a boxing background but took the narrative to have more than just a, I'm just going to get in the ring kind of mentality. You ain't got educated. So the name of the show that you first started out with was, remember that story named, what was it? The Next Great Champ, uh, the Fox reality show, uh, Asa De La Hoya is the Next Great Champ. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah, I remember that. And that was the first time I'd ever seen you. And with that being said, when that first initial breakdown happened and I was looking, I was like, man, that brother right there in shape. I wonder what <laughs> he can do. And they use your face more or less to carry the show, right? Cause yeah, yeah, had, it, ended, it ended up being that way, yeah. Yeah, you, you had that look, you know, that people were like, okay, this guy looks like the champ. <laughs> he looks like the guy that's going to come out of there. How did that end up turning out for you? What would you say was your best, biggest takeaway from being a part of a show of that nature? The biggest takeaway of being a part of that show was being involved with all the, uh, the, the cast members and the trainers. Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, the, the, the trainers were Tommy Brooks and Lou Duba. They trained two teams. Of, mm-hmm. of guys, six on one side, six on the other side. Um, we had guest appearances by Joe Frazier, Larry uh, Holmes, uh, Ken Norton, uh, you know, other guys that uh, uh, just popped up uh, from around boxing that, you know, uh, trainers like uh, and cut men like, uh, like mm-hmm. Rudy Hernandez, Stitch Duran, you know. And, wow. Uh, not to mention the people that wasn't even on camera that just were on set, you know. 
So that yeah. was uh, something in itself. Asa De La Hoya, of course, being there, uh, Eric Gomez and all, and being there, Raul Jaimez, uh, even um, uh, 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 everyone from the, the whole uh, Golden Boy uh, front office uh, and other guys in, that were uh, in the beginning stable of, of Golden Boy, like uh, uh, yeah. Les Campbell and people like that. Um, the best takeaway I can remember, I remember the first day I met uh, Joe uh, Frazier. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was, it was like a, 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 a surreal moment uh, for the simple fact that I had watched and, and heard so much about Joe Frazier growing up, you know, uh, following him, rewatching old uh, fights of his and stuff. Even though I, I, was, I was in a football and, and I come from a football family of, uh, yeah. of people, uh, a professional football family, uh, we always watched boxing, especially particularly with uh, Larry Holmes, of course, uh, because he uh, was a uh, he had uh, had a lot of fights out of Atlanta at the time. Um, but uh, to, to see those guys in person, and in, in the first ten minutes I ever met Joe Frazier, he he taught me probably more than I had uh, like like three years of boxing in ten minutes. So he uh, he Joe taught Frazier. me how he taught me how to handicap people. Uh, as far as uh, uh, smothering their punches, how to turn yeah. on on a on a hook, how to how to um, uh, it's almost like a Wing Chun uh, type technique of how to use your stiffen your wrist and, and and punch down on people's hips and and things yeah. of that nature. And turn guys on the inside. It was, mm -hmm. man, it, was a, it was like going to uh, the Harvard of, of boxing, but it and, it and it all happened over over a two month period. So. It was fast learning, but but I was like I was a sponge, just soaking everything up. Yeah, man, that's powerful. I figured when you put yourself in that that library of geniuses, professors of boxing, people who have been groomed by some of the greater um, teachers in the sport, and of course he was in a serious downline with George Benton and just a, an immaculate Philadelphia. Uh, legacy of teachers and that's one of the reasons I wanted people to get a great insight of to who you were and where your lineage come from so you know that how you p impact that you were the, at the beginning of literally you were at the very beginning of the age of reality TV how does that feel when you realize that because you know I don't know if that's what you thought about have you ever really thought about that but that's the reality you were a part of the first reality television when it comes down to the fight world you know how do you respond to that <laughs> man uh looking back it, it was great you know um one of my good friends now is uh, jesse brinkley and uh um, yeah we talk about it and uh and, and all the people on that, that were on my show we tap in and talk about it every once in a while uh, over the phone or either on the internet yeah. And it, it was it was unreal. Like it was one of those situations going in. It was so big, like the, the media around it. I remember the first time um my auntie saw me on Entertainment Tonight. Like Oh and, man. And, and it was like she was like, Whoa, hold up. Like you said you was on a show, but I didn't know it was like that big. Like you're on entertainment tonight. And I'm big like time. I'm like, Yeah, man. I'm like, this is this is for real. Like, you know, people, people that I went to high school with were seeing me on uh, commercials, but they actually was, wasn't sure if it was me because um, I had lost, um, you know, uh, I, I walked around at like um, 215 pounds or, of, of, or so of uh, muscular built, but yeah. like a, a bigger built when I yeah. was in football. And then I had to get down to, to uh, like, you know, 172 uh, uh, to be on the show. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, so they were like, yo, like that looks like him, but that dude is ways like more smaller and ripped up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. So it, it was, it was, it was great. And just knowing the, that, that, uh, to be a pioneer of, of, uh, of, of, of that is, is crazy. Like even now I watch, uh, uh, reality TV with my, my kids and stuff and, uh, and, and they'll like have assumptions about like what's going on or, or and I'm like yo you do realize that that was filmed like six months ago right and they're like what no this just happened <laughs> they're like, no. I 
on like they, they they already know what's going on already. It's, it's just funny like to see the ins and outs because every show runs off of the same basic um uh uh foundation, you know, mm-hmm. no matter what the reality show is. They, yeah. they they record a certain way, they have what you call drive by interviews, they have uh uh it takes usually like uh three days to film one episode, you know. Yeah, so it's, it's just funny knowing what's going on behind closed doors, you know, like where, where the Wizard of Oz is sitting, you know, and then um, and, and then seeing it uh, come come uh, uh, to reality. Circle. Yeah, and, and that's produ- that's production in its finest in its finest realm, you know, seeing that stuff, people having to figure out, hey, I thought this thing happened. You're at the crib. The show's been over for two months. <laughs> And then they they release it, and then they're trying to figure that out. I know that's one of that was one of my challenges with the sport, trying to figure out these reality shows that are not so reality time. <laughs> they just kind of have that production. <laughs> but when you think about that, and you take what you've done, man, and what when you finish with that, that's a real moment. I know you had to feel like, all right, now what do I do from this point? What was the next step in your career once you finished with that reality show? Well, um, for me, it, it, like I said, it, it all came together. It was all the grace of God. I, um, before my brother died and before I even had, was on the reality show, I was already slated uh, to be a, a Don Chargan fighter. Like I was going to, you know, train for like maybe another five or six months and then uh, uh, turn pro on one of his cars uh, at Arco Arena because uh, Golden Boy and Don Chargan were doing like these big fight cars at Arco Arena. And I, luckily, Sacramento was a boxing town. California's a boxing state, of course. And um, mm-hmm. so uh, uh, my plan just went went right together. It's just that I got a uh, – it's almost like uh, I got a gift from God to uh, um, uh, launch my career, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I won a, a seven-year uh, contract uh, with Golden Boy Promotions, as well as a, a great deal of seed money, and um, and uh, from there I just uh, just sat back and, and watched uh, uh, the great company of Golden Boy Promotions do their job pretty much. And I had a you know a manager and coach in uh, Nassim Navaroni, and um, and they they mapped me, they built me, you know, all the way up uh, to uh, my first. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, NABO title fight and WBO title fight. And then uh, from there, you know, uh, um, I left them uh, and, and and became a, uh, what, what, what do they call a, um, a unattached fighter, meaning that I didn't have any promotion, but I became my own uh, manager because uh, much like uh, other sports in, in football, I, I, I have a master's degree in sports management. So I, I, I had, you know, put it together as far as, uh, you know, everything just come together. I, I, I put it together and was like, man, I can do this myself. And, and, and I just became the biggest hired hand in boxing, I think. Wow. Your own. That's big time. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great way to take about it. But you already had the business cache, which, as you can see, a lot of athletes don't, not just boxers, but a lot of athletes don't have that understanding that you sports is – is is kind of what you call there are the people who are the pawns and then there are the people behind the joysticks controlling everything so you had the ability to be behind the joysticks because you had a business cachet would i be correct in saying that yes 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 i i, I come from a, a a family that you know we we dream big and, and we and we try to achieve it you know yeah so what would you say to the people who are the athletes and even some of the trainers that are out there and expect things to just kind of lay themselves out without having that behind the dashboard knowledge? Uh, in boxing, you can, you can, the, 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 the blessing and the danger behind boxing is that you can uh, develop a craft you can uh, 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 become a part of uh, something. You can be a self-made businessman without actually knowing anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and that's that's the American dream. But also, that can that can also be a downfall. I've seen many fighters with great talent um, uh, think that they know the business of boxing, uh, leave people that they that you know they don't think they need anymore, 
or, mm -hmm. or, or be in, in bed with the wrong people that are taking advantage of them and just have no yeah. clue and then they get used and abused and thrown away. So I would say that if you are in boxing, even if you're not going to go to school or whatever like I did, you know, but um, you should at least educate yourself with business. We live in the information age, you know, anyone can get on and learn how to read uh, sports contracts or learn what, what the jargon is uh, in, in management and stuff like that. From there, you need to get not only a manager, but get someone that's qualified to manage it. Cause there's in boxing, you don't have to like, unlike uh, uh, the, uh, the CBAs that are, are, are in uh, other sports, like, you know, uh, major league baseball in NBA yeah. and, and, uh, and um, NFL, Mm -hmm. A manager doesn't have to be educated or, or even uh, have uh, any uh, type of um, uh, anything really. Degrees or a yeah. in boxing. All, all he needs is your is your contract. I mean, your signature on a contract, right? Mm -hmm. So, with that being said, a lot of fighters just show up with anybody. You know, like, oh, this guy says he's gonna be my manager, so I'm, I'm riding with him. Get someone that knows what they're doing, that has a track record. They don't have to be the, the um, yeah, you know Shelly Finkel or anything like that of the world. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, but, but don't just show up with any anybody. And then a lot of times, uh, um, uh, even if you're not gonna do it yourself, like I did down the road, even though I was doing it myself, I had a fall guy, my my guy Audrey Pratt, because nobody wants to talk to a smart boxer, believe it or not. <laughs> So I if I would have, if I, I got in a couple of situations where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing my own, and they're like, what? Like, nah, like, you know, we're gonna. They try to lowball me. I'm like, yo, that's not how much this fight is worth. I already, you know, got eyes and ears on, on around the the, uh, the world to tell me that this fight is worth X amount of dollars, and this is what. Oh, I don't want to do business with you anymore. <laughs> and hang up, you know what I'm saying? So I, I got smart, and I was like, yo, okay, uh, first. Um, my uh, my wife at the time, my ex-wife uh, uh, Shana Griffin, I had her be my face uh, uh, person as as my management, and then mm -hmm. later on, my business partner uh, Audrey Pratt, who we uh, ended up starting the OPP uh, boxing promotion together. Yeah. See, that's 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 what people want to hear, and like you're a smart guy, and some of the individuals that are, you know, they, you know bless them for trying to to be a part of the sport and making assumptions we don't want you guys out here especially those of you who are watching on facebook thinking that you wake up in the morning and you don't it doesn't matter if you have a a serious person in your corner you can just jump out here and just work with the champ you know it, 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 the objective is to have a person. Now you can call them a mentor. You can call them uh, your, whether it's a, a parent, a close friend. LeBron James brought his high school um, brethren with him and allowed them to educate themselves on the job. And that's kind of what, it, that's kind of how it happened. There was no, I went to college to do this and became a master at it. And then LeBron James hired me and brought me into the fold. It was pretty much, hey, I trust you. And let's make this thing happen. And that's kind of what it, it was. And you were self-educated. So when you see this kind of thing, man, you got to let them know. And this is my thing is to fill in the gaps for the people pretty much how that would look if you were to take that under in under your wing and make it happen and so you kind of just painted the picture you were smart enough to have it going was your father around when you were growing up no <laughs> uh unfortunately he wasn't i um uh my mother uh was a single parent i did have uh uh her brothers yeah my uncles that, that filled the void and, and, and praise god my mom is so amazing yeah. That, um, that, uh, that, that I don't have any regret about, uh, not having a father. My mom is a lady with, with, uh, with two master's degrees herself. Uh, oh, yeah. and, um, she's also a, a minister. So, and now, uh, uh my yeah. stepfather, uh, who they got married when I was a senior in high school, 
and he's also wow. a minister. So both my, my parents are ministers. And, okay. uh, you know, just come from, you know, smart a history of, uh, of, of hardworking uh, Southerners, yeah. you know what I'm saying, sharecroppers that became educated people and, you know, went from there. That's a that's a beautiful thing, and it's a real thing. So you can kind of see the pattern behind every one of these type rainbows happens to be somebody who's steadfast behind the education part and the guidance of and kind of helped and in, 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 in gave that administrative part to it. So this is what I want people to kind of peel back because, you know, Otis, uh, Mr. Griffin, what we have been trying to do is not only just speak to the fight world or show them what goes behind developing athletes, but it was imperative that we show them not only the step-by-step when it comes down to what it takes to develop it, but the bridge, the gap so that there will not be a lot of confusion on how and what goes into becoming an elite level athlete. And with that being said, you've seen us do what we do and trying to do our part to help. And I know you can appreciate what we do over here in the School of Boxing because you understood how serious having that education was because you came into the sport and you started to realize this is not just throwing your hands <laughs> you remember when you we first crossed paths oh yeah you started yeah. noticing us tell them one thing that you acknowledged about what we were doing over here at master boxing well the first the first thing i, I noticed was was the commitment to dedication you know and then it was the uh, it was the science of, of what you're doing and what you sim- simply have done at, at Master Boxing is you've taken um, what would take people at least like five years yeah. of wandering around. You know, they, they call it being lost, coming out of Egypt, you know, Exodus, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you've narrowed that down into a, a, a program. So, so they are actually getting the education of boxing at a, at a, at a high level mm-hmm. in a program and learning all the stuff that I just mentioned that I learned, like being around like these top people learning, like, oh, how do you put on a fight camp? What do you eat? Uh, How, what exercise do you do? How far do you run? Uh, You know what I'm saying? How do I find a good manager or whatever, you know? You've already done all of that in in, in in your program. And I think it's it's probably one of the best things that have happened to modern boxing right now. And I'm not just tuning your horn either. I've, I've told you several times, like, some of the stuff that you're doing is so brilliant, man, and, and, and they should thank God for you, those youngsters, definitely. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, man. We, we, we understand that we want to be respected. Otis, you came from football. You know, you've been in the likes of Joe Frazier and, and Oscar De La Hoya, legends, um, Hall of Famous, uh, people whose names written in blood in the, in the history of boxing. So you understand what it takes, what they knew. Like, from, from you speaking specifically to how uh, Frazier teaching you certain hip shots and how to use the wrist and anchor like it's so much for people to know that they have no idea behind those layers in boxing they just have no idea and I said hey man we cannot progress as a sport as a unity and as a community in sports with African-American athletes a minority of any race and even the majority how can you go into this thing thinking that it's just about what I see on television how many days a week did you train, right? When you're training and you're fighting for titles, you're reaching out there to fight and fighting against, what would a typical day look like for you in a gym? Give these people just an insight because now we're live on, on our Facebook page and I want you to speak specifically to those days, how they felt to you from the inside out, the maniacal drive, all of that stuff. Well, well, first, I'm going I'm to give you the, the blue collar uh, version because a lot of people, they assume that, um, that uh, because of, uh, you know, all the, the, the lights, camera, and action and everything, that everything is pretty much handed to you, right? Yeah. But before I got uh, uh, to that level and got on TV and, and all that stuff, um, a typical day would look like uh, 
I had to, of course, go to work. I worked in the Department of uh, Corrections, right? Yeah. Um, for California, which is a is a pretty pretty uh, taxing uh, job in itself. So oh, I can imagine. So, so uh, my uh, work day would start at, at uh, 2 p.m. from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. I tell I was just telling a guy about this, my partner about this the other day, and he was like, "What the heck? Like you didn't even have time to sleep." So I would get up at um, at six in the morning. Mm-hmm. Before anything, I, I used to love it. Like before anything, I'd be out on uh, on uh, Jackson Highway out here in in uh, in, in, uh, in the outskirts of Sacramento, and I'd be running. And all you was it was no cars. All you see is deers and, <laughs> and things wow. like that. Right, I'm running. Wow. Like this is every day. This is like uh, at least uh, 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 six days out of a seven day week. I would I would do this. Wake up at six, go run. Right, come home. Uh, eat breakfast with, with uh, my kids because I was married and I had kids at the time. I would take my kids to school, right? Yeah. Take them to school. And then from school, I would put my, my work uniform in the truck and I would go all the way to Roseville, which is was a um, uh, uh, 15 to 20 minute drive for me. And I would go to Nasty Navarone's gym, who was my trainer and manager at the time. And um, and I would work out from... from uh, uh, 11 to uh, no, no. I would work out from from 10 a.m. to uh, to 12, right? Mm-hmm. And, that, and that was all boxing. So I've already done my conditioning. Yeah. I've already ate breakfast. And yeah. Now I'm gonna do my boxing, right? Boom! I do my boxing. Da, 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 boom! I go to work, which is a um, is a 50 mile drive from Nassau's gym. <laughs> I do go to work uh, in Vacaville, Whoa. California. And, wow. Um, and and then uh, uh, I would do that six days out of, out of the week. So then, in between that time, to speed up my development, um, coming over from football, I noticed that uh, I'm an A B C type uh, uh, guy, meaning that I need to know why I'm doing stuff, and I need to know mechanics. And I was a good mimicker, so I would take all my favorite fighters and I would mimic all the stuff that they did well that I thought would look well in my 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 fight game, like yeah. Holyfield. Uh, Roberto Duran, uh, uh, Joe uh, uh, Lewis, uh, uh, Joe Frazier, and um, of course uh, Ali. Right. So I would mimic all these these things, and um, and then I would I would pretty much steal what they're doing, copy it, put my own spin on it, and then mm-hmm. and then add it. So so watching film, you know, being a part of football, followed me over to boxing, sped up my development, and then just having the regiment uh, and and the hard work. Uh, from football and, and that I learned uh, from my family uh, uh, followed me over. That's serious, man. And the dedication that it takes, you couldn't lay down. No, your opponent wouldn't care if you didn't get enough sleep. The last mm-hmm. thing they cared about is your health. And the first thing he wanted to do is expose those things. So going into the, the next great champ that was sponsored and, you know, brought on to the scene by Oscar De La Hoya and the moguls in boxing that were, you know, a part of that journey that really started to show the people who would, would follow, which was the contender series and all of those, that it looks a certain way. You got to find, because you really did, man. You, you, were, you had the Adonis whole thing, man. And for those of you who are just tuning in, just the simple fact that you were built like a you know greek god out there and that's kind of what the stereotypical you had the apollo creed look going on and so that's really played to what they wanted to the show to do is to bring that kind of guy you know there was ishe smith right oh no ishe, ishe was on the contender we he came on, on the on contender we had, we had david pareja uh uh um uh um uh Gilbert Zaragoza, mm-hmm. Rene Amijo, I remember um, that show. Jimmy Mintz was a great, a great fighter. Rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alonzo, uh, R.C. Reyes. You know, uh, you know, my my memory is so shot out right now. If forgive me. No, nah, it was it was it, was, but it was a long time ago, and it was a lot of punches ago. It was a lot of training <laughs> regiments. A lot of punches. Ago. <laughs> a lot of punches. <laughs> Look, you ain't got to be in graphic detail. They just need to get a play by play how this was, 
what am I doing that warrants, you know, me to feel like I can, because what I have is this is 145,000 people on this page. Mm -hmm. One of the things that there is a lot of is a lot of delusionary people. And they do, they see what we do and they think you can just copy it and do it. And I say, yeah, but what you're looking at right now is a skill, drill. <laughs> it's a trade. In it's the trade. gym, you got skill sets and you have a system. Like you can't learn boxing by just looking at a drill. Like you can get closer to getting killed by depending on drills and traveling around YouTube and traveling around Facebook and Instagram thinking, I put this, put this, put this and add this, but all of that stuff is about a storyline being told. And it shows you how to get in and out of the storyline. What you're just learning is a skill, but you have to learn that there's an entire bevy of information that goes along and surrounds that one skill, which I don't have time to show you all that unless you are a part of what we do in the school of boxing and the objective was to hear you tell the story it just makes it so real because you're the guy who had to figure out how i want to be successful in boxing so standing on the scale and i got one of our pictures on one of your pictures up and you're in the scale and you're just flexing and that plays to the boxing audience but those people weren't around those other six to eight weeks that you were in the camp they just see you at the weigh-in they just see you flexing. You're going for the title. And that's what they think. It starts from that point to you swinging in the ring. So they're <laughs> seeing that. They're seeing those swings. And they're thinking, all right, that's what it looks like. They don't know what it looks like. You get it? And that's what we are doing these type shows and speaking specifically to people. Because you are at the very, very front lane of reality TV. You are, you were, and, and everybody that has played a big part in boxing and the trail to get us to where we are today, I'm making sure that I get them and reel them in so people understand and know who they are. And when you see that name, yeah, he's doing other things now, but understand his place in boxing history. You know, he was the front lane, you know, they used it as entertainment on television and on the big screen and then they try to figure out how to take it from the big screen and put it on re on television and you are at that first generation of that so for that we tip our cap because you can't do this thing without having the the internal fortitude so we appreciate you brother for real oh right, thank you guys for, for definitely having me on and uh and i've been watching you know your program from afar and and like I said, everything is, is right on, man. You know, speaking about some of the stuff that you just said, like even um, leading up uh, 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 to the fight, you know, um, um, Lou Duva once told me that uh, you can't be a, a Ferrari and, uh, and put in that uh, unleaded gas. <laughs> and, um, and he's exactly right. You know, um, the regimen of eating, uh, some of the stuff uh, that, that I did, I had a, a diet, um, called greens and things with wings, meaning that if it was green and it had, you know, wings or fins, I would, I could eat it, but yeah. otherwise I, I can't eat it. Um, uh, there's a, so there's a great deal of uh, fish, uh, chicken, um, very, if, if any uh, meat, very lean red meat, you know, yeah. and, and definitely a lot of uh, salad and roughage uh, uh, to go with it. Um, a lot of people don't understand, but um, a lot of times in, uh, in America, our proportion of food is enough to feed three people of, <laughs> of one person. So you have to cut down those proportions. Uh, oh. And then one trick that I used to do that um, uh, nobody uh, really thinks about is the last meal, what time did you eat? Because yeah. your body goes into fat storage uh, uh, usually around 8 o'clock uh, p.m. Oh, yeah. So what I would do is I wouldn't eat anything after 6 o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, and then I would only eat a uh, vegetable or, or maybe some fruit and then drink water uh, mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the night. So what it, then I'm losing weight in my sleep. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, yeah. and there's just like, you know, there's just uh, ways that you got to take care of your body. Um, I was always uh, heating up to come in the gym. This is old football technique. Heat up to come in. You know, everybody's like, dang, man, it's 102 degrees outside. You got a sweatsuit on and a beanie. Heat up to come in. Ice out. <laughs> 
you know, I go home and take an ice bath. And that's why yeah. my career had such a long duration also, you know. Yeah, smart. That's brilliant. And that's elite. That's the stuff of the elitists. And that's what you get when you're around the right kind of people. You do the right kind of research and you don't try to take shorts, you know, because you're taking shorts. You're going to end up coming up short 1000 percent. So now that we know who you are and what do you think is your most valiant time and in the sport what what was your biggest takeaway what happened to you in boxing that was that you put the crown on as that crowning moment you know there could be several things but that one that made you realize that you made a lot of right choices and this was one of them well um the first one of course was was winning the uh the next great champ um i was you know on the outside looking in, like when I, like I said, this thing was filmed like, you know, six months <laughs> before. Yeah, so on the outside looking in, I'm watching it for the first time with, with all you guys. And I'm like, man. Yeah. I who look, are you rooting I for? Like, something. like who yeah, are you, you know, rooting like, for when you was watching it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, wow. Like, I actually look like the real deal. Like, you know, like I can see how I end up winning this thing, you know, and, yeah. and then seeing like all the focus and, and everything. So that was one moment, just realizing who you are, you know what I'm saying? Because before then, I'm like, yeah. oh, man, I'm just, you know, you know, a, a, a kid, a, a fat kid from Alabama that, that, that got in shape and, and got, got doors uh, closed in his face until one opened, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And then, but then uh, it just uh, from that moment and hearing uh, uh, what uh, the Golden Boy staff had to say about me and, 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 yeah. and, by them uh, mapping my career, like them, their belief in me and saying, dude, you're going to be the next, you know, uh, uh, you're going to be a champion. You're going to be a world champion. You're going to be, yeah. you're going to fight Roy Jones one day. You're going to do, you know, like what, like me, like what, you know what I'm saying? Like, like stuff yeah. like that. So um, that was one moment. Uh, the next moment of course was uh, winning the, uh, the, the NABO uh, uh, title. I'll never forget that night because they made a mistake on the contract, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and contracts are always if you if you guys that don't know about pro boxing contracts are made months in advance uh, you know how much you're going to get paid how many rounds you're going and and, and everything so i won the mm -hmm. the uh the uh the nabo uh, uh title and um the purse wasn't right right so i was upset about it and i'm like yo this ain't the money i'm supposed to get man like what what's going on and I was like, I'm not signing the contract. And then um, uh, we had like, uh, it was in Chicago. So mm -hmm. we had you know, like a very tough commission. They were like, oh, well get out of here then. Like, who cares? Like, we'll scratch your fight right now. You know, all the stuff. Wow. So um, I went and, uh, and I went, uh, uh, you know, I had already did the weigh in and everything. And, um, and Raul Jaimez, you know, God bless his heart, wherever he is, uh, yeah. one of the Golden Boy uh, reps uh, came to me. He's like, Otis, we're going to handle the contract. Don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. Go beat this guy. Don't let this get off the table. This is the foothold that's going to spring your your career. Do not let this. This is every time you you're about to do something. He's like, believe me, I've been around Oscar since high school. He's like, mm -hmm. every time you're going to do something, there's always a diversion to try to throw you off of it. He's like, please, look at me, please, just go fight. And I was so like. All right, uh, and then so so at that moment, and then winning that fight, there was a whole bunch of stuff that 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 happened. I had the wrong shoes on, like uh, Jumpman uh, 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 gave me these brand new boxing shoes that I was supposed to try out, and the in the in the um the bottom of them weren't built for box. You know how like you can have shoes, but the bottoms aren't right the right thing for bo for a boxing yeah. ring. Yeah, so I kept. I, I look like Bambi on ice, you know. Oh. I just had this conversation the day before yesterday with my guy. So it's just crazy that you're saying that. Continue. Yeah, yeah. I look like Bambi on ice. And I'm, and I'm panicking because this is the biggest fight of my life. And I can't even, I can't move and I can't stand up the right way. So I'm, I'm, I go to the corner and I'm crying and asking Navarone, who, and this guy's a great motivator. I don't know if you've ever seen him on uh, HBO or anything, but, uh, but, but he got trainer of the year on HBO for, for one of the most motivating uh speeches ever uh to chris cruz but yeah like he was this is like you could if you if they could record this guy needs a reality show yeah um, anyway so he's like 
he, he's sitting there and he kind of like grabs me. He goes, listen, all kind of stuff is going to happen wrong. But this is the fight of your life. <laughs> he's like, you got to win this no matter yeah. what. He's like, so whatever's happening, we got to get over it and we got to win. And then I end up, you know, uh, uh, winning by a uh, eight round uh, uh, KO. So that was one of them. And then later on, of, of course, after winning the, the WBO title and everything, one of uh, uh, the fights that a lot of people don't really realize how big it, it was for me, not even the guy who I beat, Byron Mitchell. I remember Byron that. Mitchell is, is from Troy, Alabama, just like me. He didn't realize that, that I was a little kid that was watching him do his thing in the Olympics and, and being the WBA uh, champion and, and all this stuff. Um, he didn't even know who I, who I was or even that I was from uh, Alabama because a lot of people uh, associated me with Sacramento uh, after I got, I got older. But I was born and raised uh, probably up until uh, my teenage years in, in Alabama and then moved uh, to uh, Sacramento. So anyway, to make a long story short, this guy was Superman around my neighborhood, right? And he was Superman in the sport of boxing. I don't know if you guys realize who Byron Mitchell is, but this guy had cinder blocks for hands, and he would get off the deck and then knock people's uh, heads into the fifth row sometimes, you know? Yeah, that dynamite. The guys that, that ever put Joe Kazagi down, you know? Yeah, Kazagi. Yeah, as we just had this conversation. My guys are going, they're freaking out. <laughs> this, yeah, Joe so, Kazagi, I was telling them his punch variables, his punch variations and things like that, you just have to have an arsenal. So I'm uh, sorry, man, go ahead, continue. <laughs> yeah, 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 Joe. And, and, and that was, like you said, that's a feat in itself. And that if, if you guys ever get a chance, go back and watch Byron Mitchell versus Joe Kazagi. Anyway, so. I remember that fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I fought that guy, Byron Mitchell, who, who put, you know, him and Joe Kazagi knocked each other down, I think, three times apiece, and then finally uh, Joe war. got him. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but but that's the kind of war he gave me, you know. Um, and after that fight, I knew that I was a real fighter. Up until then, I kind of was um, uh, in better shape than people. That, see, the thing about me is I always believed, in, and this is what one of my uncles uh, told me, uh, uh, Bobby James Griffin, um, is that someone can have more talent than you, you know, they can have a better pedigree than you. They can have all the accolades that life can give them. But one thing that they can't have is they can never outwork you because work is a measurable tool that only mm -hmm. you can supply or, or, or subtract from, you know. Yeah. So no one can outwork you unless you really let them. And I took that and I flew with it, man. So especially in all these situations, like with being a, a, against people like Byron Mitchell and stuff, I was like, look, He's going to be a better puncher. He's, he comes from an Olympic uh, background, but I'm going to outwork him. And, and, and uh, that was probably my favorite fight out of everything because I had to go through hell to beat this dude. Um, I uh, ended up uh, being uh, down uh, after this fight for like six months because um, my, my nose was uh, Physical. Uh, deviated. You know, my uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. ribs bruised, all kind of stuff. So, yeah. Wow, that is a triumph. So once again, you can't train some things from the outside in. That is from the inside out. You know, that is a makeup of you, your DNA. And after you go through these things, it's inevitable that you're gonna be successful because of those things that you can't teach that resolve that internal fortitude, that mental offensive and defensive prowess, the things that make people want to quit, make you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> that, my friend, is the difference between a champion and a guy named Barney. <laughs> that's what you got, brother. So that is just... That's why I'm, I, I, I'm, I just appreciate being able to see you being successful. And I'd like for you to just kind of share with the people, you know, what you are doing now when you stepped out with that level of fortitude and just mental awareness on business and everything. I see that you started your own business. Give us a little bit on that. Oh, yeah, I started my own business uh, as far as uh, with uh, managing uh, fighters, of course. 
and mm-hmm. uh, and, and working in uh, in boxing gyms and, and things of that nature here in the, in the Sacramento area. Um, one of my uh, uh, best businesses in, in, until uh, uh, yes. uh, this last uh, season, of course, was a game game day transportation. I started uh, which yeah. uh, takes people to uh, to uh, 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 athletic games uh, here in, in in California and soon to be uh, nationwide. Uh, hopefully we get over to Vegas and, and be there for, for the Raiders. But um, it's a Beautiful. tailgate company. We take you to the to the event in a, in a party bus that seats uh, 40 uh, people. We cater uh, everything for you. And then uh, uh, we make it a whole event. You know, you, you go, you you have your beverages, your everything, uh, your food, your experience uh, in, in, in the NBA, Major League Baseball, or NFL, uh, wow. and even soccer coming. Um, and then uh, when you come back, you don't have to worry about driving home. You don't have to worry about getting mauled in the parking lot uh, by uh, by uh, the, the rival fans and everything. Uh, you oh. just go, go home to us. We take you home safely. And, uh, and, and that's it. It's a perfect marriage. That's amazing, man. You might as well do something cool if you're going to do it. That, my friend, <laughs> is cool. And, you know, the director of our company last year, I think, sometime looked that up and that's how they were able to connect the dots with you and that business. I was like, yeah, Otis has a great company model. I was like, man, I want to definitely help with some awareness with that because we have a marketing agency as well. And I, I definitely like to plug that company for you, especially when everything starts to get back to its new normal. And it's amazing, brother. That is just great that you're doing something that is, is super cool. I mean, and a lot of people can't really see their nose despite their face whenever they're so engrenched in doing something. You are able to come out of the sport. Just tell people a little bit and when it comes down to how important is it to have a game plan B when you get finished with the sport of football, boxing, whatever. One of my uh, uh, favorite quotes by my uh, another one of my trainers, Saipedema team, uh, always have a plan or plan to fail. And, uh, and, and he's exactly right. So uh, along uh, the way, you know, me and him would have these deep talks and we would plan for the future and everything because uh, he would tell me little stuff like, he'd be like, uh, hey, uh, OG, uh, so uh, is that your last fight? You know, we're getting into like, you know, the 40 fights, the 35th fight type thing. And I'm like, why are you saying that? And he's like, uh, because when we were going back to the dressing room from the ring, you forgot where the dressing room was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, well, he goes, it's a, it's a minor thing right now. He goes, but it's just going to get worse and worse. He goes, so you got to know when to hit your exit. He goes, and we coming up on your exit. So what, what do you got? He goes, I always have a plan, a plan to fill. So he would always come at me with, with, with little quizzes and puzzles like that. And, uh, and, and that's how I came together with, with this kind of stuff. Well, it's brilliant, man. And you're, in the, you're already in the right area, you know, you, to come up with that. And it was a need for it. And it's a need for it everywhere. And, mm-hmm. and to take that and scale it around the country, man. Yeah. So that, so that that in itself, that's where a uh, a uh, uh, business uh, marketing comes in as far as uh you know uh, yeah. having a sports business degree. You know uh, what what are the uh, demographics that, that that want the product? You know supply and demand. Yeah. Everybody knows that. And then uh, you uh, when you look at a um, a, a business structure, you got to pick. There's there's like five different business structures you can have, right? Yeah. The one that I I, I picked was the, the franchise business structure. So. For instance, it's almost like uh, you have like a, a McDonald's or whatever, right? McDonald's yep. started in LA just being a, a, a push cart, right? Yes. Then after it grew, they came up with a franchising opportunity where people could buy into to it and, and still be a part of it, but they have Brilliant. to do Ray a Croft. Of thing. <laughs> These are what you call regional divisions, you know? Yeah. So, so that's what it's all about. Being smart, expanding, being able to scale it great margins and it's a demand for it and sometimes people don't even know it's a demand until they see it and like that's exactly what i need and this is going to be like uber everything's gonna come out of it 
lower accidents, lower fatalities, better insurance. I mean, like all the pluses and no minuses, unless your team loses. But <laughs> the objective is to to solve a problem, and you solved a problem with your with your business. So I'm going to mention a name to you, and I want a couple of names. I want you to and tell me the first thing that comes to your head. Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick, man, he's uh. They thought he was going to be uh uh. uh Black the sheep. clown, but he ended up being he ended up being a goat, right? Because now it's funny how how you know you get persecuted sometimes when you step out on a on a ledge and you do stuff by yourself. So yeah. many people persecute. Even uh, my mom used to always say, even even uh, Jesus was 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 persecuted in his own city. Nobody knew who he was, you know. And um, but Colin, looking back now, man, uh, you, if you don't think that he was uh, brilliant or sent sent here for for a motive. For you know a motive, then something's wrong with you because now even he has the NFL apologizing. You know, so uh, uh, he's a pioneer, he's a trailblazer, and and uh, in, in I respect and in, in, in honor uh, Colin. I always have though, uh, but but it's good to finally see him to get it get his uh, his just due. Would you agree that it took steps and step like his what he did was a step. The fact that he was around to see that the other thing that happened to cement his argument in in the reality is it was a very short amount of time, four years, three, four years, and it come full circle. And he's around to hear them apologize and to basically begin to have things named after him now because he deserves that spot to be that courage to step out on a limb. Nobody was there really with them, even though some certain people made the gestures, they weren't with them because his name was the only name tied to it. You don't name anyone else. So would you say that that was a noble act that he was around to see the end part of it come full circle? So noble because a lot of times, especially with people, you gotta remember Colin Cagney was, a, was at the time, he was up there with, I heard, I was watching Lance Armstrong's uh, documentary the other day. Yeah. He mentioned Colin Kaepernick. He was like, I, he, Lance Armstrong says, I was up there with Colin Kaepernick uh, uh, and all the other star athletes and, yeah. and everything, right? Um, so for him to, sacri to, to remove himself from the equation mm -hmm. and do it for his people and, and, and not only his people, but for all of America, because this is this is what America should be able to do. You're supposed to be able to, to protest and have freedom of speech. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But these yeah. people were were were, were pretty much uh, uh, restraining him from doing what he had to do. He got everything pulled away from. Him. It's not easy, you know. It was a it was a yeah. great uh, sacrifice, and for that, you know, uh, a lot of people wouldn't have did that. A lot of people would have been like, you know, like so many other athletes, even the NFL players that, that he probably has to yeah. walk with him. We were like, yo, man, uh, I'm going to go back and get this $7 million check. <laughs> yeah, because like Colin Cowher said, he wasn't marquee name at that time. So if you are marquee, if you're on a LeBron James level, if you're on the level of uh, the Drew Breeses of the world, you can, you will do things because you know they need mm -hmm. you. They, they can't persecute you. But he was on the bench. Things weren't going his way. You're disposable. And then you step out on that. So... I think that was, it's definitely a noble act when you will pay the price for, for doing what you're going to do and may not be around. Most likely most people aren't around, aren't around to see what they did. Like Harriet Tubman, like you're not around to see, <laughs> she ain't around yeah. to see. Anything. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. Period. And but, but, you're not around. It, Martin it's Luther great King. Martin Luther he's King. Gonna be... Oh, Martin, yeah, Martin Luther King, definitely. But no, Harry Tubman, I, I like no. that example. Yeah. The, I like that. Yeah. I mean, one guy who was around to see himself celebrated was Muhammad Ali. And he was, I mean, really able to see it. You know, he's been around. He stayed around for a long time after the fact, understood his value, know what he meant to the sport and the world, and still remains the most popular athlete's name in the world. So 
with that being said, I think Colin did something noble and I just hope people really see and, and, and continue to understand what protesting is opposed to rioting. And when I say the word protesting, what do you think it means now opposed to prior to when Colin Kaepernick did it? You know, how do people view it now? And when he stepped out on that limb and now these people are doing it now, they won't stop now. They're trying to really make something happen and some change. And the thing about it is more white people than it is black people. <laughs> That's what's so crazy. In every protest that you see, it's like 70, 30. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. if it wasn't for Colin, it wouldn't have just, if it wasn't for him getting all of that pushback from that, I don't think the numbers would trump their, their scenarios. And this, it's a beautiful thing to see them join together, no matter what cause it's for. It's just been way too overdue. And I didn't think this time right here, it's a real thing because I see legislation starting to have it to change their laws for law enforcement. And I think this is, this is with that, with that sacrifice comes out of it, something really, really great that's going to move us forward. Even in this current weird space that we're in, in our new normal. So Otis, I, I just can't, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this and I will return the, the gesture and, and, and I have the power to do so. And because I love what you're doing, I love what you did and what you've said to these young men that will be watching this video over all through the week. And if they don't, they better because this is what you're saying is the kind of stuff that we need for these guys to truly understand the kind of man you got to be to step into that ring and then be able to step outside of that ring and operate with the same prowess. So, brother, this was a pleasure and a blessing. And I continue to bless you all the way. And when your blessings pouring forward, I pray that it's with God's speed. And until the next time, I would love to, you know, connect with you and have you come in and speak to the guys individually, I mean, uh, collectively in our school of boxing online, because those guys are really dedicated. They're one of the few generations at the first generation of being educated in a school of boxing to be learning it the right way and to teach it the right way. So I love to have you in one day for about 15 minutes of your time. You know, it's just a beautiful thing, man. So I appreciate you joining us today. Oh yeah, no problem. Thank you too, Eric, man. God bless you guys' hands and you guys keep doing what you do cool. and, uh, and keep growing in success, man. You guys are, are starting to be the, remember uh, I was talking to you about um, if the way things were going with the, the, the older trainers passing away that, yeah. Good boxing was going to be lost with these guys. You're yeah, yeah. you're one of the institutions that's keeping good boxing around. So commend yeah. you and please continue. I appreciate that, man. And tell people how they can follow you on social media. I always like to make sure that people can connect. Uh, you can follow me on uh, on IG. Pretty much everything that I do is always next great, N-E-X-T underscore G-R and the number eight. So if you see that, then that's me. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Google Otis Griffin, and you'll see all of my uh, 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 links and everything yeah. come up from game day to boxing gyms to whatever. Cool. Well, we're going to definitely connect, collect some all your information, and I'll make these all clickable links when we produce it and put the video back up. And thanks again, Otis, man. Have a blessed weekend. I'll see you next time. All right, champ. All right, now. My man.